Here we go, everybody. All right, we will get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to ADL Live. I am Melinda Burgess, and I'm going to start us off today by telling you a little bit about our organization that's hosting this today. Um, AGL is a nonprofit association working to help government modernize uh, by building shared knowledge and community among people who work for government and in government. You can visit our website at agilegovleaders.org to learn more about us and how you can be involved. I'm going to type that in the chat for anyone interested. And today we're here to discuss UX in government and how we can reach users in creative ways. And we have a fantastic panel of folks here today who all have experience with how to prioritize UX in government projects, even when that's challenging to do. I know they have some excellent insights for us and some stories too, I hope. We'll let them introduce themselves in just a moment. Um, I did wanna let everyone know that we are excited to get questions from you all as we talk. So you can use the um, chat icon at the bottom of your screen uh, if you click on that, you'll be able to type a message right here into the Zoom chat, and you can feel free to um, ask questions as they're, uh, as they're talking, and we'll try to get to those. Um, feel free to put your video on, but do please leave your mic muted so we don't get background noise. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Alexa Choi, who will moderate today and let her get us started. All right. Thank you, Melinda, so much. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and kick this off by having our panelists introduce themselves. So it's kind of listed here, Christy starts, and then Jim, Brenda, Rachel, and Carla. I think uh, Brenda's not here with us today, but we will follow this in the order here and kind of... Oh, Alexa, you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, we're having the, we're gonna have the panel. Sorry, we're gonna have the panel um, go ahead and um, introduce themselves. So, Christy, why don't you start? Followed by Jim. Hello, uh, I am Christy Hermanson. I am the design lead at Dental Services at, um, Administration's Integrated Award Environment. And what we are doing is we are modernizing and integrating ten federal systems that are used for contracting and grants. They're public systems. We have upwards of maybe 1.7 million users and really diverse set of users from federal contracting officers to small nonprofits, large corporations, small businesses, tribal nations, universities, hospitals, you name it. So very broad um, and large uh, community of users and um, a, a complex enterprise integration effort. So a lot of fun and a lot of challenges. Perfect, thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Jim Lane. I'm a UX uh, leader. I've been doing it for about 20 years, leading teams at companies like America Online, uh, Revolution Health, Add This, Oracle, uh, most recently Virtru Corporation in DC, which is a data protection um, and privacy organization where a lot of our customers are in education, government, um, and uh, it's a really exciting and important uh, field. I also started a meetup group called Nova UX, uh, which has been offering monthly events for UX professionals since 2008. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Rachel? Rachel, yep. Yeah. There you go. Oh, there we go. Okay. It's telling me I couldn't speak. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Croft. I'm with Civic Actions. Um, I play a variety of roles there. I do kind of anywhere from like UX research, service design, content strategy, all of the above. And a lot of my role is like working with clients and figuring out how to best embed a really good UX process within any of our projects that we do. And so Civic Actions focuses on local state and federal government projects, a number of different agencies. I'm currently working with San Francisco Department of the Environment on creating um, a new uh, website, a mobile responsive website for better disposing things for the city. Awesome. And um, in the past, I've worked at various consultancies, um, Frog, Peace Project, um, Pivotal Labs, and um, love working in, with like various engineers and product managers and super advocate of kind of having a balanced team mentality. Cool, perfect, thank you. Um, Carla. Hi everybody, my name is Carla Rodriguez and I'm here in Washington DC and I'm a UX designer and a UX researcher and like every other UX designer and UX researcher here in DC worked in the 
uh, typical gigs that are nonprofits, working with uh, government, as well as working with um, software companies. So a lot of my experience has been working with diverse different um, groups of users and bringing them um, as an advocate to the understanding of the stakeholders and into the process of all the products that I've been very fortunate to be a part of building. Currently right now, as a part of SDSI, I'm supporting login.gov, which is part of GSA. So happy to be here, thanks. Absolutely, thank you. All right, so we are gonna go into something um, kind of new this time around. And we are going to take a look at this word cloud. And it's kind of a lot of buzzwords put into one place here. I wanted each one of our panelists to pick a buzzword, talk about it, dispel a myth, um, kind of relate it back to what you do. And, and really this is kind of getting to some of the finer points to kick off our discussion. And I wanted to go ahead and um, start with whoever wants to jump in first. And if, you're, if we're missing a word, you can also add a word. So there's no rules, um, but I will hand it over to the panel and somebody go ahead and jump in. So I'll jump in. Um, I'm gonna actually take two words and put them together here. Um, and, and the words are information and architecture. And, and part of this is due to the nature of the systems that we work on, but they're large scale enterprise systems and the amount of data, the amount of information that we have. To, and I think you see this a lot in government right now where people are really trying to connect information and bring it together. And I'm going to use sort of a, a, a tried analogy, but it, it, to me, it's lipstick on a pig. Um, if, if you don't get that information, the way that your information is organized, the flow of the way people are going to navigate through the system, if you don't get that right, then um, I think you've lost the battle before you've even started. So, um, so for us, information is just super important. Um, and, then, and then once you get that right, then it's just really making it look good. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. I think that's a very good point. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And Jim, Rachel, or Carla, want to jump in with the next ones? Oh, Jim, you're, you're muted. Uh, sorry, there we go. Uh, so, and, and I think, I think content um, strategy is really tightly connected to that, which is really super important. Carrie Hayne just did a book called Connecting Content, I think, which is really good. Anyway, I think the word I would, I would pick is, it's not in here, um, but I hear it all the time, is simple. And I talk a lot about simplicity because um, it can be a bit of a trap. Everyone wants to be simple. Everyone says they're simple. Um, but there's a, a great quote, I think it's attributed to Einstein about taking things simplicity as simple as necessary and no simpler uh, and so like really understanding who we're designing for and having the appropriate level of uh, simplicity or complexity for whatever their needs are so um, that always is kind of an oversimplification if you will that's I think frustrating thank you I think um, identifying end users and talking about how we can find and engage them is one of the key discussion points mm -hmm. yep. so thank you for that perfect Uh, Rachel or Carla? There we go. Um, I'll take a step back. I think a word that I would love to see here is empowerment, um, especially with um, like various people in government. Um, my the clients who I worked with in the past and currently are truly such wonderful people. They're so passionate in what they do, but I think sometimes they're in systems where they're not necessarily empowered to kind of like do more and make more connections. Um, you know, bringing in a level of service design and experience, working and being connected to policy people and the tech team. So feeling and knowing that they can have agency and empowerment, I think is so huge for bringing all kinds of things, not even just UX, but you know, great development, great product management, great kind of everything, kind of ways of working. Um, I started reading the Peak Academy right now, um, which, um, I forget the full title of the book, but it's about um, kind of the city of Denver um, really empowering like government employees to take agency of their own job. And they did a lot of work in training and a lot of work in understanding where you can look at your own job and trying to objectively understand where you can improve efficiency, um, inefficiencies in your own role and your organization and being rewarded for that, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's like a lot to that um which even you know you could start to say like what's the employee ux experience right um within working in government not even just like technical systems um that they're trying to deploy um so i see that as like massively 
missing in some ways um, to some teams. Um, and I know there's a lot of various um, innovation teams within government, like trying to push for that and make that happen. For sure. I think that there definitely are uh, digital services for one. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Rachel. Appreciate it. And we're going to come over to Carla. You are not this time, but I think you're not this time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hopefully you can hear me now. Um, definitely like um, the panelists have explained it and I'm picking process as my word that we've explained a little bit about the complexities about UX, the complexities of bringing in out on board. Um, and one thing that sometimes we are encountered with is the response that UX brings a lot of complexity and brings a lot of processes into it. And that those processes sometimes will affect our time, timelines and delivery. Um, but those processes are really for the benefit of the user. They're really not for our internal benefit as, as, a, as a practitioner. So we also want to like um, sometimes have to deal with the processes that are already in place to um, kind of impede a lot of the work that we want to do. So processes, I think one of those like heavy words that we deal with um, in all kinds of manifestations as a UXer, especially working with government. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I love how there's progress. I love process because you can always see it getting better right? It's like a good baseline of like what, what happened before, but then where are we today and how do we improve from then to now? So yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. All right. So after that awesome um, discussion, and I also noticed that one of our audience members wrote down the word um, intuitive. So I, I think that that's really also a great word. Um, and somebody told me that if something wasn't intuitive to use, it was probably irrelevant. And so I, I felt like that was right on target for a word that if it's not in here, it needs to be added for sure. So thank you for that audience member who posted that. And we're going to go right into our first question, which um, Christy, I think you actually helped us craft this question. And it was, which aspects of UX should people be paying attention to in the government space today? Because it's definitely changing and, and growing um, as a field. And I would love to kind of hear what people think. So I'm going to throw that to the audience. I mean, I'm sorry, not the audience, to the panelists. So, um, so I think you know, it, it's. I think we all recognize that there are challenges to um, to the, all the competing priorities in federal government between you know security priorities and business priorities and policy requirements. Getting those UX um, priorities in there are, are always a challenge. And so, for me, the easy thing to do is really to look at what has momentum. <laughs> right now and, you know the 21st century idea act was passed back in december and so agencies are really going in and trying to figure out how to respond to that and so there's different areas that have a lot of momentum now as a result of that so to me those are the low-hanging fruit are the things that already have uh, are picking up steam so things like mobile friendly and and the plain language standards and um and searchability search engine optimization some of those kinds of things so to me paying attention and, and knowing exactly um, what those things are that, that have that kind of momentum in the government. Um, I think it's, it's easier to get justification for getting those priorities in. Um, our agency is also paying attention to um, data-driven, uh, you know, what, what sort of data you're getting from your users. So it's easy to go in and say, okay, I'm gonna go talk to some users and get data. Um, and, and, and that's gonna add value. So, um, so, I would say look for what has momentum and, and in particular we're looking at things being driven by that 21st century data act or digital experience act. <laughs> Absolutely and automation is a big piece of that and I'm really curious about how that's going to impact the future. Um, so yeah I really appreciate that that's 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 yeah. a huge momentum yeah. different things. Yeah. Okay thank you for that Christy. I think uh, I would mention privacy is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, of course, I mean, it, there's just been uh, so much in the news around, uh, around data breaches and privacy protection and legislation internationally and domestically of, of as organizations, um, what are we required to do? What should we be doing? How do we think about, how do we think about privacy? What does it actually mean? Um, and what are our customers' expectations around it? And, and, and Virtru, you know, obviously working with government and healthcare and other kind of customers like that, that's it's huge. They, they have a lot of regulatory constraints um, 
and that are evolving over time. So I think that's a really exciting and important space. I think that can be. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, cybersecurity, all that big time. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Carla or Rachel? Yeah, so definitely cybersecurity is one of the key concerns for our team at logins.gov. And we're always thinking about not only the cybersecurity and the user experience aspect as well, but how is that managed at the agency level? And what are the tools available for that? And how can we improve those tools so we can improve the end user experience as well? So it kind of starts to bring in a little bit of, of uh, some um, enterprise user experience um, into our practice. Absolutely. Yeah, I think privacy and cybersecurity is obviously huge, um, but I think even more foundationally is still looking at things on the team level um, and how are just organizations working together and making sure that silos are being broken down um, mm -hmm. and having really great, you know, thorough experiences. I mean, I, I think um, one of the things I would think a lot more about is how to bring more policy people into UX teams and just overall product teams. Like no one should really be in silo anymore because mm -hmm. all these pro problems that we're mentioning are extremely multifaceted. Like they require so many different types of brains to work mm -hmm. on these challenges. And we live in an increasingly complex world, right? Like when you think about even just like five years ago, how much things have changed on the internet or how we're like meant to interact um, or not interact or like what to expect now. Um, so I think just really looking at how you can bring so many more diverse people into teams to then tackle what like I would call more of like the, the core business problem um, of the agency and then really being very, um, vigilant in understanding like what that core problem is. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree with that one. Um, thank you, Rachel. So we're gonna skip down a couple questions because um, I feel like a very valuable piece of this discussion is going to be some real life stories from you guys. Um, each one of you have been in the field for a while and in your in your industries for a while and have a lot of experience. So I would love to hear real life stories on how creatively pursuing your users can positively affect outcomes. How did you find them? How did you interact with them? Did you sit down with them over coffee or did you like tell us some stories? I'll start. Um, just a very brief anecdote. Um, sometimes uh, we don't have direct access to users, but other people may on our team. So one, one project that I was involved in had to deal with very specialized, very select group of end users that was somebody I would not be able to, um, because of the, the way the project was set up, that I could not really interact with an interview, especially doing those good, meaty, one-on-one -on -one interviews that you get all kinds of good insights. That was not possible, but I had a very understanding product owner who was in meetings with those people. So she took a list of questions so we could formulate a good understanding of those people as um, our user group. And in meetings where they were all present, they were all really you know, very happy to answer questions. And by going through that list of questions that I provided her, um, she was by proxy the user experience researcher in that mm -hmm. way. So we were able to just get some better understanding of those users and their needs and their pain points and, and all those insights, they always feed back into improving the product. Absolutely, for sure. Awesome, Carla. And I do have to say, um, Carla and Christy, uh, your guys' systems that you touch and play with impact every single person on this call probably. <laughs> and so, and, and all we, the time. We don't, um, we don't ever have trouble finding people who wanna talk to us. Yeah, so I'm sure. we're really fortunate that way. Um, our problem is bandwidth. Yeah, you know, 1.7 million users and so many. Um, it, and you know, I think my schedule for engagements this month is probably eight or nine. Um, I'm doing a, a local chamber of commerce. Um, I did a universe a conference of universities where we went and talked to the universities about upcoming changes. I did a um, professional services council meeting recently, which is a contractors um, group. So, so we're always out and talking to people. I've got backlogs of features that, that we have to prioritize. So we're really fortunate, but I will tell you my favorite story though. Um, 
Because a lot of times in these meetings, you um, you get you know sort of the the professional side of people. And I was at a conference one time, and I was taking a shuttle back to the airport, and there was a woman who was a business counselor in Michigan, who was telling me stories about when she first became a business counselor, and um and taking somebody through registration in one of our systems and the person hadn't read something and it ended up leading to business failure. And it was these like really deeply personal stories. And I have to tell you, that was my favorite encounter. And it was just a chance meeting on a shuttle bus where someone was telling me these, these stories that might not come out in a professional setting. So you really never know where your next information might come from. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, I, I always feel like connecting with strangers can lead to who knows what, it's always a very exciting thing. So that's, that's a great, that's a great story. Yeah. And that casual one-on-one -on -one was just a really nice, you know, to get, to get the really deep personal stories. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. And you probably never forgot that either when you were talking about developing that particular system, you're probably like, Oh, <laughs> when you asked the question and you said stories, that woman was right there in my mind. Yep. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. And Jim or Rachel. Uh, I, I mean, this, I, I'm thinking back through different teams and, you know, sometimes you have more access to users than others. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes you have to get creative. And what's always interesting to me is the reasons why you, why you don't theoretically have access to customers. And sometimes it's, sometimes there's regulations or, or, or rules, but, um, and, and sometimes there are certain teams like the customer service team doesn't want to give you access to customers mm -hmm. uh, like oh they we'll, we'll talk to you we'll you know, we'll talk to them and then you can talk to us um so you're getting creative i, I had a, i had a team once where we went out and, with clipboards and went to the local strip mall and we're just asking people questions about that particular feature or product um, and so that was a chance to you know just get kind of sometimes you just have to get creative um you know and control for bias and all that stuff but but uh um but i always encourage you know research guys to get out and you know ask meet people talk to people understand what they're what they're trying to do and how what we're designing can help address their needs yeah. awesome yeah so to build on jim's point um street intercepts are really really great um so that's exactly that is kind of just again taking agency hitting the streets but um, picking your locations very thoughtfully so most recently um in the city of san francisco I did um, quite a few street intercepts and we picked strategically certain parts of the city of where we understood our initial target audience would be. And so um, we went to those locations. Um, sometimes we had to, you know, tell the business, like we went to kind of a very environmentally conscious grocery store, which mm -hmm. we knew that's kind of going to be more of the mindset of our um, customers and um, called ahead, said, Hey, like, is it okay if we come by with the city? And, you know, we worked with um, the team, my current client team has worked with them before. We warned them, they said, no problem. We're wonderful to cooperate with. And, you know, as people are grocery shopping and catching people in these moments when it's like, yeah, I guess I'll take a moment to, you know, fill out a survey or talk to you for a few minutes and get feedback on our current product. And, you know, those are great ways. Um, the other way is to do um, a proxy user if there's, um, you know, people that you don't have access to. So those are the people who, um, they could sometimes be SMEs, like people who are experts in a particular category. Um, and they might have, you know, they're not the end user in that they're experiencing your product, but they still might be able to give you just enough valuable information to, again, lower risk. And so the whole point of, you know, why we go talk to people is a lot about lowering risk to make sure that we're building, like, the right thing for that like particular target um, or, you know, subgroups of people. Um, so sometimes those people can act as the SMEs as, as good proxy, not all the time, but sometime. And then you just kind of have to know as your team, like what risk are you taking on by talking to a proxy or not talking to many people at all? Um, and the other thing to build on kind of Christy's point is kind of consistently over time, trying to just kind of like lightly weave people back into um, your feedback loop, right? And so when you're working over very like longitudinal products, which pretty well government systems like should be um, mm -hmm. over a long period of time, you know, you just kind of collect stories as you go and you kind of make sure that you're always using that more as your North Star to make little adjustments, not needing to do any really like big discovery 
or um, needing to get like massive insights. So even thinking about it as, oh, even if I talk to five people, maybe it would just even help just to give me a little bit of signal, a little bit of direction, right? Um, and even that in itself can help. So I think also approaching it, we're not needing to come up with this big, massive study that needs to happen, um, but kind of uh, taking kind of small chunks sometimes can also be a good approach. Wanted to um, just a piggyback on that was really good comment because it uh, when you're talking with proxy users, it also helps to dispel dispel assumptions. So there might be assumptions that are might create a lot of hesitance from your stakeholders and just those like small studies that just kind of clear the air. We've seen that very recently where we had a, a small group that was very concerned that maybe there was a segment audience that would not be able to do some interactions on the site and this very small study just cleared that that was an assumption we had about that segment group and it totally cleared that path for us to go forward. Sounds great. Um, Carla and that's thank you for adding on to Rachel's comment. Um, I, I have a question for the panel and it's off script so get ready for this. But it pertains to what everybody was saying. So um, technically, you know, one of the things that UXers do is they build personas. Do you feel like building personas off those end user research points is more like locking your research in a box and not giving it room to breathe? Or do you think personas are still the right way to go to kind of build those understanding patterns of what needs to be done? And that could be, I'm just throwing it out. So we have personas, but again, we've got really large um, audience and, and, and a lot of functionality. So, um, so we call them enterprise personas and we're very clear about what they are and aren't useful for. Oh, so perfect. In and they identify, so we have a contract um, officer persona and we have a, a federal assistance recipient persona. Um, but within that federal assistance recipient persona, that covers everything from small nonprofits to large universities and state governments. So, this, so, so it's very good for communicating who our stakeholders are. It's very good for helping us sort of say, okay, this one's important for this part of the system and this persona is important for this part of the system. But, um, but within that, you know, if I go in to create a particular experience, then um, it, it, I have to get much more detailed <laughs> And so that persona provides a scope, it provides a broad umbrella under which we function, um, but there's a lot of room to breathe in there and, mm -hmm. and any given um, experience might just be one aspect of, so, um, so I, we find them useful, but, um, but we're very clear about what that use is. Um, and, 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 you know, like everything, it's a tool. It solves a couple problems, but you don't use it for everything. Got it. Yeah, I, I think Chrissy just um, used the key word, it's a tool and like that it can be calibrated as you go along, as you have more studies that you get additional insight, you refine your persona, you actually build and it, it can evolve. So definitely it doesn't, it doesn't have to be locked in place. I think personas are a really interesting tool and they can be kind of polarizing. You know, some people think they're the best things since sliced bread and some people are like, ah, that's a total waste of time. And I think it's like any other tool. There's, there's ways to use personas really well. Um, and there's, you know, doing personas for the sake of doing personas and having pretty pictures up on the wall. Um, and uh, they, they can be, they can be really powerful tools. Um, and so, yeah, and we did them, you know, we've, we, we typically will do them. I think sometimes the interesting question is, which personas do you pay attention to? Because there can be lots of different personas. And so understanding which are the most important ones that we're trying to serve and which ones are more secondary and will be fine if we take, if we take good care of the primary ones and so on. Yeah, I, I agree. It's definitely a tool. Um, I think more of the framework that I I personally have um, found a bit more useful sometimes, um, especially with um, very broad, heavily functional applications is kind of a jobs to be done model, um, which is more just looking at tasks and looking at kind of like what are the main tasks and goals that people need to complete. Because I think especially with government applications, um, you do need to be, you know, like 508 compliant. Like you do need to make sure that it can be translated into Spanish or, you know, like Mandarin or other languages, depending on kind of who your constituents 
it's ours. So there's kind of these like natural things that need to then make sure that you're serving for kind of like a much wider audience anyways. So making sure that first like the task is right and the goal that like someone can, for, of course can go through and complete this form and then kind of layering it with some of like specific demographic information, right? That you'll, you'll need to have. Um, but personas are great, right? For generating empathy and um, just overall kind of like someone to like, you know, it's a nice focus. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, but to me, the, the more jobs to be done model is um, I think on a more mass scale with government sometimes um, like for what I've just found more. Yeah, one interesting. Useful, relatable. Yeah, w one application, we ended up doing a bunch at, at Virtru and, uh, and, and they're fine. And uh, what I thought was really cool was when the development teams were presenting features to the executive team, here's this particular thing we've been working on. Um, every single one of them always started with a persona. So in other words, this is for an enterprise administrator. This is for this particular kind of end user. And, and seeing development teams framing problems that way was I just kind of made my heart kind of swell because it was because uh, it is they're framing everything they're doing to what kind of person is this helping? That's that's great discipline to establish. And that's exactly what we do is we use it to frame. That's so awesome. The idea. homepage small business persona because the small business the, the homepage has to be simple enough for a small business. Um, you know, role management is a federal administrator, particularly a DOD administrator because DOD is massive. Um, and so the role management is designed for federal administrators like DOD. So absolutely framing is, is, is where we start with that. That's awesome. I love the idea, Jim, of um, in a demo, having your dev team present as a persona. persona. That's a really cool idea and an easy takeaway too for the, the listeners. Um, thank you for that, guys. Um, so my next question here is, um, what is something that we can do right away to start connecting better with our users? And, and also there is a question from a panelist over here. So you can choose either question. Um, you can answer the question, what can we do to engage right away with our users better? Or um, do you think that incentives are necessary when seeking customers input? I'm assuming they mean like Amazon gift cards, like build a survey out and we give you something fancy, something sparkly. Um, so either question. Yeah, so I can answer the incentive question. Um, I think um, it's looking for what that person might value. It might not necessarily be an Amazon gift card. Um, and you can also kind of stay on brand with the within your government agency, or even in my case, the government agency that I'm working with. So for example, I'll give you two examples. Um, with the San Francisco Department of the Environment, what um, we did was we gave away LED light bulbs. And as well as, yeah, I know, it's like, you know, trying to be environmental and, and encourage it. And, you know, when you're working with the outreach team, it was kind of a perfect fit because so much of them are about helping educate the public and getting out there and giving those tools to people, as well as we had these really great stickers of showing like what can be disposed and whatnot. And so they can take them to work and put them on their bins. And so these are good, just like fun giveaways for trying to do good engagement. There's some exchange. Um, even, you know, we, you know, just said like, can you come help out the city? Um, we have this new solution. That'd be fun. You know, you're helping the city. So um, that in itself can sometimes like pull on some heartstrings, especially when you're doing intercepts and um, people are there to give you a few minutes of their time because they're passionate right, about like what's happening in the city of San Francisco and like they want to engage and that's actually even our target audience we were like looking at. Um, so that's an example. Um, the other one is um, when I did some research for the California DMV, um, there was no monetary incentive, but what we did was if the people who were willing to talk to us, we, they would get a special piece of paper and they get to go to the front of the line. And in the world of the DMV, that is, high value piece of paper. So actually that's actually gold in real yeah, life. That's gold. It's gold. So again, there are like within the context of where you're doing research, it's like finding what is valuable to people um, for incentive to engage them. Right. And so the Amazon gift, I mean, obviously that's a great incentive or coffee gift certificate or something, but um, I think there are ways to get creative in it. I, I will say it, it, 
it depends on the kind of research you're doing. If you're going to ask someone for half an hour of their time or something like that, I think you definitely want to be thinking about some sort of, you know, some sort of compensation. It's a significant investment of their time and they're helping you out and all that good stuff. And usually if you're doing research, you also want to indicate that uh, people that participated in this research were, were presented this compensation and so on. That's usually just part of good, good um, design. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if, I, I love the creativity. I think the light bulb is a neat idea. So <laughs> you apply creativity to your creativity project. That's Heck yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'll say it. It was a light bulb moment. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. I couldn't resist the bad joke. I'll be quiet now. We walked right into that one. <laughs> Christy or Carla? Yeah, definitely. I uh, want to thank Dana for putting that question in. And the way she phrased it was, is it, you know, to get customers input. So sometimes if you're working with an enterprise or a company that has customers and you're asking those customers for this input, if you're providing something such as swag, actually it's creating a touch point between the brand and that customer. So you definitely want to, you know, take advantage of it, create, make it a positive experience. And of course, uh, you're showing that you value what their input is as well. So even if it may even matter more than a generic Amazon card. So I think it's a great opportunity. Absolutely. So from a federal perspective, we're not even allowed to get swag for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> Much less to get, you know, to give away that, you know, the agencies are pretty strict about what we can and can't do. Um, so, it, it's never really even been on our radar. Um, what we found is that a lot of people will sign up to come and provide input just because they want to know what's going on. And I, the I know I would. <laughs> that they're getting from that session seems to be worth their time a lot of the time. And, and most people will treat it like it's a webinar or a, an information session or a, you know, a, I'm an industry day type of thing. And, and, so it's almost an information exchange. We tell them what's going to happen, and then they tell us what they think. And, 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 and that seems to draw more people than we, we can, could ever even talk to. So, Absolutely. And something we've done on Teams is, if, if it's technically possible and, and feasible, is folks that have given us feedback like this, even if we don't necessarily give them a tangible incentive, um, they might get early access to features. So they might join a group that will have uh, beta access to try things out. And that, that alone is they're just excited to participate and, and see what's new and be the first to know. Um, and that can be a really powerful incentive too that doesn't cost you anything. Absolutely, speed to knowledge is definitely a perk. <laughs> awesome, perfect. So we're gonna move on to the next question, which is how can we build a culture in government that recognizes the value of experimental activities like user research? Throw that out there into the wind. I mean, um, I think I've noticed how just even doing kind of internal stakeholder research and showing how when you talk to just even internal stakeholders and how their feedback gets like folded back into the product, how that in itself that they've experienced is really powerful. So then you're then just saying and extending that saying, oh, we're going to do, see how we got your feedback and how the product improved. We want to now extend that to end users or kind of extend that kind of broader. Um, and then, um, so I think that's really valuable. The other one is even like bringing them into doing research, um, which, you know, if people are open to and being a part of, that's huge. So I brought um, a couple policy folks into the field before we came up with a discussion plan beforehand, reviewed the goals of the research, and then, you know, trained them a little bit on how to conduct as well as like what to listen for um and then we synthesized together after and so they are like now deeply invested in like what this experiment was and um the engagement just kept getting up and up and up and up because people realize like they get so much energy from like seeing what happens when something's like in progress and they get to be a part of the experiment and i think that's so big um because i think it always inherently feels super risky when you hear how like this team of people are like going to go out and do something experimental. And then you're like, what even is that? Like that just, you know, as a stakeholder, I, you know, if I were a producer in a project, like that kind of sounds a bit like, I don't know, you're like, what's going on over there? Um, not that to not trust the team, but you just don't have any understanding. So 
to then help bring them into that as much as possible to get understanding. So then the next time they don't feel like they need to come with you or, or like they know what, oh, I know what that looks like. Oh, okay, great. Go, go do your thing. Right. That's almost like what you would want to do. So I think it's also an aversion or reaction to like, they don't understand what it looks like. Um, and then when people under, start to understand what it looks like, it's a lot easier to just inherently just trust the process. All um, right. So two of the words I picked up from you was engagement and um, inclusivity, right? So you want to engage them in it and include them. So then, then, then it's no longer a mystery about the value of it, right? Because they're a part totally. of seeing the value with their own eyes. So that's always huge. Yeah. Totally. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that insight. So I think, I think leadership support is one of the keys and, and really bringing your leadership and, and we have really great support for, uh, I feel really fortunate in, in these kinds of discussions when we talk about government, because there's really good support at GSA for, and, and on our team for UX efforts. Um, so, you know, so, so I think getting your leadership and, and reminding your leadership of the value and demonstrating the value as you're going and, and getting them on board then helps it, you know, move throughout the organization. Um, the, the bigger challenge we have, you know, you can say you're doing UX, but, but sort of right sizing it um, and, and knowing, you know, um, what's the right level of effort and, and, and getting it um, incorporated. So, you know, things like, um, like contracts, for example, you know, um, and, and cause you know, and I'm going to get a little bit into the design side of it, but, um, but getting design and UX is a cri evaluation criteria on contracts as opposed to it being like heavily technical or, um, or, you know, when requirements are done, um, making sure, you know, that the product owners are, are always getting that user feedback, you know, so, so you can say you're doing UX, but really getting people to automatically include it in all these different aspects of the program. Um, is, so, so, so yeah, you can be doing it, but, but really trying to make it foundational is, is a much bigger challenge. Foundational to what everybody's doing and, and then really right sizing the, the support that you have. Um, because right now, you know, it's still a really small fraction. If you look at the size of our team compared to the size of the UX, you know, our UX team isn't big enough to support the size of our team. So we're always completely overloaded. Mm -hmm. And the, the, as the team grows, the UX doesn't. So, um, so, so we're doing UX, but, but there's always challenges. <laughs> I always like the word right size because I feel like it's like the holy grail, you know, it's like what it's, it's hard to even know what that is. Like if you had a hundred more UXers, would that solve the problem or would it create more problems? It would probably create different problems. It would create different problems. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, you don't want to just continue to throw bodies at the problem at the, but, but yeah, getting to the place where, yeah, you're, you're a lean, lean machine um, is, is a challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so, so the culture is kind of there, but, but you can always work on it. Awesome. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Brenda, I know you had a question or a comment. If you want to add that in the group chat, that would be a perfect place to put it. Um, we're going to, we're kind of opening it up to some audience feedback here in a little bit. So that would be great. And Carla, if you could, or if you wanted, um, I'm like, how do I remember that? For what were you, what were you saying, Alexa? So it is. Um, I, I was just um, saying if Carla, you wanted to chime in on the last question. Um, oh, I, I wanted to chime in as well. Go ahead, Brenda. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm sharing an office space, so excuse the background. My name is Brenda Velasquez. I do UX research for the city of Oakland. And yeah, yeah, I yeah, think that that's, yeah, that's when cool. oh, yeah. projects come, uh, there uh, are on a case by case basis. And uh, there's an IT team here that there's a predisposed, uh, there's a process. And usually the process can take two years to get a request for proposal going and then, in, you know, buying the software and testing it out. And then that feedback loop is long. And so um, if that process is there and in government that's considered fast, 
um, what would your value and you, what you do bring is the question. And so uh, the value is, we know is in failing and failing quickly. But when you have money and outcomes on the line, hearing that you are gonna fail quickly is a, a scary proposition for someone who's responsible for equitable outcomes for their community meaning that someone is able to pay for their, ta their, their parking ticket, that they're not being um, overly policed, that they're able to complain about potholes and that the city will respond and go fix it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what that means is in, so when I approach these projects, um, it's not just about bringing them to the research, is that you're, you are being a trusted advisor and you're figuring out what their needs are by listening and understanding that they have a lot of stake and that these um, research sprints, whether they be three months or six months, uh, helps them get to a solution faster rather than waiting for IT to bring in requests for proposal, then getting bids, and then going with uh, a contractor, and then um, starting the project and then debugging, implementing debugging again, which can be like a five-year process, versus knowing early and often what are your needs and how you can best reach your um, intended audience. Whether that be uh, people who speak Spanish, people who are um, uh, in the homelessness community, so. Uh, I don't even throw around terms as UX. I don't try to dazzle them um, because the work is very much about people. It's and knowing how they interface with your service. And if it takes a digital component, then so be it. Does it take, does it take a, a app? Does it take you getting a contract with Airtable? Um, you know, if that's the case, if you have no budget, what can we do for you? So it is on a case-by-case -case basis when you take a project and you have to really um, uh, uh, strip your, your, your jargon away so that way they can understand and make sure that um, what you propose moving forward is, a, is not that you're just going to fail, is that you are removing risk and making sure that they meet their intended goal, uh, whatever that may be. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, that's great. I actually want to piggyback on that. Re removing risk is a good phrase because I think if you're in trying to improve that culture internally in government about the value of UX, if you make some noise and you actually try to socialize some of those findings, socialize them internally as well as externally, one of the things that login.gov does is we put on GitHub the results of our usability tests. And it shows how we've removed risk. We tested something and we've improved that. Otherwise, that um, iteration might have gone out and caused some, um, some friction for users. But we removed that risk through these um, findings and this usability studies and the user research. So we're bringing in that value and showing that to our, to our audience in general in, in a very public forum, such as GitHub. Very good. Thank you guys so much for those important pieces of um, intel shared with us. I had um, a question from the audience that was submitted pre-registration, um, and that was, have you found ways to attract and keep UX folks on your projects? I think this is a really important question. And um, Christy, I know you have some thoughts on that. And hopefully Rachel and Brenda, Carla, Jim, and I, I know all of you guys have hired UXers, um, interviewed them. And you know, how do we keep them happy and engaged and, and really loving their job? So to me, it goes back to leadership again. If your leadership is on board with what you're doing, then they're gonna create a lot of space for you to do um, interesting things. Um, and it allows you to build those relationships with the users. And I think the more you know about your users, the more interesting the problems are gonna be that you have to solve, um, the more creative you can get with trying to solve their problems. And it, and it creates a really good environment where you can do good work and, 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 and you can build your resume, right? And, and walk away from that job some point down the road you know, with 
a ton of really great experience. So, so it's really about providing those opportunities to do really good work to keep people, UXers engaged and feeling like they're growing and, and, and developing with those relationships that they're building. And, and, and to me, it all, again, starts with, with having good leadership and keeping your leadership you know, informed about what user experience is, educating them about what it is, educating leadership about the value. And if you can get leadership behind it, then you can create opportunities for UXers. And you know that nobody's going to stay forever, you know. Um, if I, you know, if someone comes onto our program and stays for two or three years, you know, and, and, and then they walk away with a really great set of skills that they can take to their next chapter of their life, then I love to follow what they're going to do next too. Um, and, and keep those relationships open. Um, so, you know, it's, it's creating an environment where, where you can do that. Yep, that's the heavy lift is creating an environment, hiring the leaders, getting everybody on the same page. <laughs> yep. I, think, I think goals play a really, really important part uh, to, to doing that. So, uh, you know, my job as a creative leader is to set up my teams to be successful um, and, and support them. And, and one of the ways I, I like to do that is to make sure that each designer has goals that, uh, that roll up, measurably roll up to product goals and product goals that measurably roll up to uh, business goals in the organization. So in other words, day, day to day, you know, my, my goal is for everybody on my team to really understand how does my work contribute to the success of the team and the success of the group and the success of the organization. Um, and, and also, that's also, by the way, a side effect of that. It's a great way for UX to be more strategic. So when you're part of those conversations about, well, what, is, what are the business objectives we're trying to achieve? And then how do our product and design teams and engineering teams, how are everything that they're doing roll up to contribute to these business objectives. That's a great way to align the organization and align UX as a strategically critical part of the organization, and not just fix a monkey up in the corner. Awesome, I love it. Yeah. And when we were talking about um, attracting UX folks for federal work, it's important also for the HR people that are kind of on the receiving end of those um, resumes and those cover letters to kind of have a little bit of understanding of maybe some of the keywords to look out for, some of the understanding of what UX really means because as we've all tried to explain UX to other folks, we know it's a complicated term. Sometimes we use different interchange of words and phrases for some of the activities we do. Those HR folks need to know uh, what to look out for so they don't um, inadvertently discard a really potentially awesome um, UXer. Yeah, I agree with you that, yep, 100%. Yep, difference between being a technical recruiter and a regular recruiter. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. There was a question um, I see by Tim, which is interesting. Um, That's a good I, Can I respond to this one? Absolutely. So it was, what if you have a small team, can UX be a role instead of a person? So I think this is really interesting. Um, so in many ways, I would say yes. Um, I would say that UX should always be kind of in the mindset of everyone and thinking about how this product can be a great experience, right? So, um, but I would say where in some ways it does need to be owned by a certain person is um, um, see a UXer as kind of like the empathizer champion. They're kind of like the user champion, right? So it's great that everyone participates in that, but um, in terms of like how, as you probably notice in organizations, until there's someone like really owning something and in their, and their, them and their job are like heavily kind of tied to it, that's when like the job really gets done. So, um, and you have a particular team or people driving it. So I think that's kind of where I would say that sometimes it's nicer to have kind of it also as like owned by a particular person or people or team. But again, with that said, it really does need to be an awareness in kind of like the whole organization and the whole team. And you can definitely have a lot of, I think a lot of organizations and teams start off where um, there are engineers who are very more, who are more passionate about it and they start taking on that role. Mm -hmm. And they go as far or even product managers or whoever, and they go as far as they can, like with that skill. So I think 
like if you're in this situation, I would assess where your team is in mm -hmm. that of, are you now needing like more capacity and kind of greater expertise um, in further in furthering your product or business? Um, and so that might be kind of like where the line is. Um, so it's just something to think about. Yep. That was awesome. Thank you. And thank you for addressing Tim's question. Yeah, sure. so, uh, can, I, can I just tell a, a story of, of where I started at GSA? Um, so when I, when I first was brought into GSA, I was a contractor and we were contracted for um, hours that, that basically amounted to about one day a week. Um, and I would come in for focus groups, take notes, go back, do my analysis. And I was working on another contract for a completely different agency, mostly full time and just getting pulled into GSA here and there. And I was the only UX person <laughs> involved at all. And over time, I've gone from being one, you know, 20% of the time person to maybe a year and a half later being full time to now being a design lead at GSA with a team of about eight people. <laughs> so, awesome. so starting off with, you know, just one day a week has gone to now a, a full team and that's taken place over about six years. So you can start off with that really small team and, and grow from there as the agency or program finds value in what you're doing. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for that. So I'm going to pass it back to Melinda to wrap up because we've only got three or four more minutes. But in the comments section, I would love for our panelists to write your favorite resources, what are your go-to tools, books, online resources to grow. Type in there so everybody in the audience can kind of see what you think are the most valuable tools and tips and books and all that. And um, Melinda will go ahead and wrap everything up. And I want to say from me, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much to uh, each of you for sharing, uh, coming and taking the time to share with us. Thanks, Alexa, for leading the discussion. And um, I'm really excited because we're going to synthesize the notes for this. We'll make sure everyone gets uh, the recording and an email that has uh, what some, I think some of the best tips I've heard were directly from you all. Um, just uh, these, these great ideas that we can actually take back and use right now um, in projects. So. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Um, again, this is hosted by AGL Association, which we like to have these conversations um, as much as possible. So whether it's on these AGL lives or the all members calls or at the upcoming AGL summit, which is in DC, this organization is dedicated to bringing people together that are doing these things. Um, so that like you said at the beginning, uh, Christy, we can find out where the momentum is and what's working for people. Um, so do please check out, you know, agilegovleaders.org. Um, you can get involved and it's a great group. Um, we see we have some, um, some suggestions in the chat, so I'll make sure to capture those as well in the write-up. Um, and thank you again, panelists, for being with us today. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>